Hi, welcome to my YouTube channel. My channel is about uh, business, specifically helping small, medium-sized business owners, travel, and inspiration. Inspiring people to do their very best in all of the circumstances of life, including this little hiccup we're in right now. Maddie's Magic Machine. In 1898, Maddie Gunterman journeyed 800 kilometers from Seattle to the West Kootenai region near the Alberta border by railway, stern wheeler and foot. With her came her husband Bill, son Henry, two dogs and one Kodak camera. With neighbors help they cleared land in Thompson's Landing now beaten near Revelstoke and built a cabin. Both worked the mines, Maddie as a cook. Unlike the northern boom towns, whole families had settled in Thompson's Landing, not just single men. Picnics, dances, and family events took place in addition to the usual rowdiness. When the mining boom ended, the family Rome, B.C., looking for work. Maddie supplemented Bill's income by fishing, hunting, and running a trap line. And she photographed it all. In 1936, Bill died of a heart attack hauling logs. Maddie died in 1945 at 73. In 1961, by accident, Ron D'Altroy from the Vancouver Public Library discovered her 200 glass plate negatives depicting life in the West Kootenays. Now they are acknowledged for what they are, a provincial treasure. Fallers. Early loggers felled enormous trees using primitive tools, an axe, and a two-man cross-cut saw while standing on springboards notched into the trunk. First they chopped the tree, cut facing where they wanted the tree to fall. From here it would take three to four hours to bring down a big fir. And when the tree began to fall, the real danger began. A branch might tear loose high up and drop onto a man. When the tree hit the ground, the butt end might take a bad bounce and crush someone. Or the tree might smash into another one whose branches would fly back. Experienced fallers learn to clear escape routes and pick a safe place to hide where the tree came down. As soon as the trunk started moving, they dropped their saws, jumped from their springboards, and ran for cover, yelling a warning to anyone nearby. The BC Loggers Union was formed in 1919, and conditions improved. Yet even with the highest safety standards, fallers still have the most dangerous job in the forest industry. High riggers. For years, cut logs were removed from the forest by means of cable rigging systems attached to a tall spar tree, a Douglas fir if possible. Preparing the tree to hold a rig was the job of a high rigger. Using a set of spurs and a rope, the rigger would climb to a height of 50 to 70 meters, 
chopping branches off as he went, then use his ax and a small saw to take off the top. Then he would hold on for dear life while the tree swung violently from side to side. The danger was that the tree might split and crush the rigor in his climbing rope, or he could fall. 50 years ago, Colin Brooks fell 30 meters from a tree on Quadra Island. When he returned to work a few weeks later, held together by steel pins, the crew had carved the stump of the spar into a likeness of his head. About 700 kilometers northeast of Vancouver, Barkerville was the main town of the Caribou Gold Rush. As soon as Billy Barker struck gold in 1862, his claim yielded over a ton of ore. Almost overnight, a collection of shanties and tents transformed itself into the largest city north of San Francisco and west of Chicago with general stores, boarding houses, restaurants and saloons plus the theater, royal and a church for the sober set. By 1880 there were enough children for a school. Like any boom town, Barkerville declined and despite a small revival in the 1930s when the price of gold skyrocketed, it eventually became a ghost town. Then, in 1958, the government of British Columbia declared Barkerville a historic site, and the town was restored as a tourist attraction, which it remains. Billy Barker, who started it all, died in poverty and lies in an unmarked grave in Victoria. Catalines Mules. In the mid 19th century, 700 kilometers across the mountains from Vancouver, waves of would be prospectors walked the Caribou Trail for the gold fields beyond Quenelle. Word of a strike on some remote stream would travel, and men by the hundreds would flock to the area with just a backpack having engaged packers to follow with food and equipment, entrusting their lives to a stranger. Jean, Cataline Cow, 1832 to 1922, was the greatest of the packers. He delivered tons of merchandise from Yale at the beginning of the Fraser Canyon to the gold fields around Barkerville, about 600 miles north. His 60 mules, were so perfectly trained that when he rang a bell, each mule would wait by his own pack for loading. Running freight from 1858 to 1912, over thousands of miles, and in all the conditions, he never failed to fulfill a contract. Only once did a parcel disappear, two pounds of Limburger cheese. One of his men threw it away, thinking it was rotten. Cataline replaced the cheese and delivered it. In the 1890s, few who came to BC ended up doing what they intended to do. Frank Swinnell arrived from Ontario to prospect for gold in the Yukon Klondike. 
Instead, he became BC's greatest surveyor, covering huge areas of the province, a landmass about twice the size of Spain, in a career that lasted 30 years. His equipment was simple but amazingly accurate. Just a transit, a specialized kind of telescope, and 66 feet of chain, 80 chain lengths to the mile to divide areas the size of whole countries into 640 acre sections. Part of his job was to record surface Soil features conditions and possible land uses, vital information for the pioneers to follow. With no roads, Swinell followed trails made by First Nation traders and prospectors or blazed them himself, cutting lines through dense forest, over swamps, lakes, rivers, and mountains. Today, Swinell is better known for the more than 5,000 priceless photos he took over more than 40 years, which survive in the BC Provincial Archives. The Champagne Safari. See you soon. Bye bye.